Well, good morning, church, and good morning to those of you guys that are joining us at our online campus today. Today is part five, and it's the final message in this series that we've been doing, Shake the Earth Revival and Awakening. And today we want to talk to you about the importance of of being fearless in these last days of revival and awakening, the importance of being fearless. And the reason we want to talk to you about this is because the enemy uses fear more than anything as one of his greatest strategies to try to keep you from living out your faith. And if the enemy can get you to fear fear is uh, is going to keep you from believing what is possible with God. It's going to keep you from remembering in those moments when you, it looks like you're all alone that God is really with you. Yeah. It's really important today that we are reminded that fear is going to keep you from believing. In those moments, in your darkest times when it looks like you're all alone, it's going to keep you from having the faith to believe that God is with you. And the enemy wants to continually use this in your life in these last days, especially he wants to grip all of our hearts with fear. So we're going to share that with you today. Today's message is entitled Fearless. So when you think about people throughout the word of God who were fearless, there's actually quite a few people that we could have picked out today and we could have talked about. But today we're going to talk about a guy who Brad and I love because this guy was a leader in the Old Testament. He was a guy who was an assistant to Moses. Moses is the one that led the children of Israel out of slavery of Egypt. But this guy by the name of Joshua, he was Moses' right-hand man. And you begin to see throughout his life, this character begin to develop in him. And I, for me personally, whenever I see a leader Whenever I see someone who speaks fearlessly, who lives courageously, I want to know what got them to that point. Because what we have to understand is nobody is born just being an incredible leader. No one is born just being this incredible athlete or just this incredible CEO. Every single person who is ever born is born with potential, all right, towards a given area that God has placed inside of you based on your calling. But when I look at the life of Joshua, I know for a fact that though Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, it, there was something prior to the moment he made that lead out that caused him to be a fearless leader. And that's what we want to look at today. So I want you to go to Exodus chapter 33. We're going to look at verse 11. And this is a passage we used a couple weeks ago. But in Exodus chapter 33, you see this story where they are, the children of Israel are out in the wilderness, Moses sets up what's called the tent of meeting, and that was basically the church, okay? It was, a, it was a makeshift tent where Moses would go speak to God. But in this passage, it says that even when Moses would leave after talking to God face to face, it says Joshua, his assistant, did what? Can you see that? What does it say? He did what? Come on, you're going to preach with me today. What did he do? Remain. He remained. What does it mean to remain? Stay, stay put, why? Why did Joshua, and this is what you have to do when you read the word of God. You need to ask questions to yourself, okay? That's how you begin to dig in deep. You begin to ask yourself, well, wait a second. Why would Joshua do that? I mean, Moses left and Moses was the leader. Why did Joshua not follow his lead? Let me tell you why. Because Joshua was hungry for God. The first step, man, if you are gonna be fearless, if you're going to be a believer who leads fearlessly, if you're going to be a believer who lives fearlessly, okay, in this day and time before Jesus returns, you are going to have to be hungry for God's presence. You're going to have to be hungry to be in God's presence, to hear God's voice. That's what started Joshua on this journey. But you know, it doesn't just stop there. Joshua was then one of the 10 guys that were chosen to be spies, to go into the land of Canaan, to spy out the land and to basically come back and report to Moses what they had seen. Because you realize the land God promised them that they could have was inhabited at this moment, okay? So Joshua goes out, he's with, 10 other, with nine other guys, he makes the tent. 
They go into the land of Canaan and they realize it's amazing. I mean, it is a beautiful land. It's described as being a land flowing with milk and honey. The grape clusters were so big, it said it took two guys carrying them on their shoulders to bring that out of the land. But here's the problem. There were giants living in that land. So when they all come back to Moses and the whole assembly, if you will, the whole church, all the children of Israel, they gather back up around Moses and the spies begin to describe what they had seen. When they get all done, they're like, it was amazing, but there's giants in that land. We cannot take that land. Let's just settle right here in the wilderness where we're at. Let's just stay right here. We don't want to try to go in and take possession of the land by the way that God said was ours because guess what? Fear had gripped their hearts because what they saw with their eyes was now gripping their heart with fear because they were bigger than them. They were larger than them. Regardless of what God said, eight of these guys were terrified. But you got these two boys, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua steps up. And he begins to depict what he saw. But then he says this in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 8, it says this. If the Lord delights in us, meaning if we have found favor in God's eyes, then he will bring us into the land and get this, and give it to us. Joshua understood what God had already said. God had already said that that land was theirs. So he's aligning his faith. But check this out. He goes on in verse nine. He says, only do not rebel against God, nor fear the people. Here's what I want you to begin to understand about Joshua. Is Joshua chose faith over fear. I want you to think about this. Joshua was there and he saw the giants. Joshua knew exactly the people who were inhabiting that land. But he chose to believe what God said. We just sang that song a second ago. God, if you said it, I'll believe it. That was Joshua. Did he know how it was going to end? No. All he knew is God said that's ours. So if God said it, he chose to believe it. Does that mean that he didn't have any fear on the inside? No, guys. That's not true at all. You see, a lot of times we think in our mind to be fearless means that you don't have the feeling of fear. And that's not true. Because... God gave us emotions. There are moments you're going to feel fear. I want you to follow me. I want you to see this definition that I wrote out. It's simply this. Being fearless is not the absence of fear, but it is a predetermined mindset you choose because of your faith. You see, in that moment, Joshua may have felt fear on the inside. He's standing in front of 2 million people, all of which are going against him other than Moses, obviously, and Caleb. And I want you to notice what happens in verse 10 after Joshua speaks out boldly. It says, and all the congregation, say all. All the congregation said to stone them with stones. Have you ever noticed this before? Have you ever noticed that in this story, Joshua is just standing up and aligning his own life with God's word. He's aligning himself with faith and the church turned on him. The believers are the ones who said, pick up the stones and let's stone him. Listen, we've been talking about it for now for months. As we roll into the end of the end, before Jesus returns, the Bible makes it very clear in Matthew 24 and 25 as you read about the end times, And it gives the parable of the 10 virgins. You can go back and you can hear our our series on that. But 50%, five of the virgins were not ready. This is a parable that Jesus gave, which was a representation that when Jesus returns, 50% of the church is not going. They're not going to be ready. What does that tell you? It tells you that half of the church is going to have turned away from the word of God. And I don't know if you watch the news or not but we're seeing it happen. We are watching churches, denominations, turn away from what God's word says to determine what they want it to say. But Joshua that day was not only fearless against the enemy, but he was even fearless against 
his own people, the church. You see, he's the same guy that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He stood in front of assembly and he said this, you can all choose what you're going to do because that is your prerogative. But for me and my house, we choose to serve the one true God. He was drawing a line in the sand. And that is what you're going to have to do as a believer in the end times. You are going to have to decide as for me and my house, I don't care what somebody on my right does. I don't care what somebody on my left does. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm not going to deviate from it and I'm going to live fearlessly. Does that mean I won't feel fear? No, you might be scared out of your mind. Your knees might be shaking, but with your mouth, you will proclaim by faith what God's word says. Amen. Amen. You see, every day of your life, you're going to have to choose. Do you live by faith or do you live by fear? Every day, it's a choice when you wake up. Every day. Will I choose to live by faith or will I be overcome by fear? What will dictate your actions? What will dictate the words that come out of your mouth? Will it be faith or will it be fear? For Joshua, it was faith. And the third thing that I see in Joshua's life is that Joshua led courageously. He led courageously. And guys, that's what he's known for. But it didn't just happen. He didn't just one day wake up and was this courageous, bold leader. No, it started because he was hungry to be in God's presence. He wanted to remain in God's presence. Day after day after day after day, he chose faith over fear. And then came the day God said, all right, son, it's your time to lead. I want you to go to Joshua chapter 1. Man, if you guys haven't studied the life of Joshua, you need to. Joshua is one of my favorite books. Joshua chapter one, in verse one, it says this. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. And he says this. Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead. I love this part. The time has come for you to lead. To lead. Some of you, you need to open your Bible. You need to highlight that verse because God's speaking that to you. Some of you have been hanging out in the shadows far too long. You've been hanging out in the shadows at work. You've been hanging out in the shadows at school. You're not stepping up and boldly proclaiming your faith. You're not living by faith. You're allowing yourself to be overcome by fear. Yeah, 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 I'm a believer. I just don't want to be very vocal. Well, you know what? There's coming a day where you're going to have to decide who you're going to stand for. And you're not going to have a choice. You're either going to stand for what's right and stand for Jesus Christ, or you're going to back into the shadows. And God is saying to some of you in this room today, now is the time. Now is the time for you to step up and lead. And that's what he was telling Joshua. Go on to verse three. It says this, I promise you what I promised Moses. I love this. This is God literally just having a conversation with Joshua and encouraging him. He says, I promise you, just like I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I've given you. Jump on to verse five. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. What did he have to be fearful of? Do you hear her God's, what God is saying to him? Like, I get so stoked when I read stuff like this because that's the same thing God's telling you. What do you have to be afraid of? Who can harm you? What do you have to be fearful of when God is on your side? Who can be against you? No one is going to be against you, maybe in, in voice and vocal, but guess what? When God is on your side, anything is possible. You guys are not shouting nearly as hard as you should be right now in this house. I'm preaching way better than you are shouting. He says, for I will be with you just like I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Verse six, he says, be strong and courageous. Then he jumps on down to verse seven. Guess what he says again? He repeats himself. Be strong. Now he says, be very courageous. But I want you to not pass over the next two verses. Listen to this. He tells him to be strong and courageous. And then he says, you be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them. Turn neither to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you 
do? How many of you want to be successful in life? Okay, just about half of you. That's fantastic. I mean, we need some people who don't want success. You know what I'm saying? I love that. That's good. I mean, well, yeah, I'm, I'm all about being competitive. So, make, you know, I like those that want to sit back and not win. You know, the fact is, <clears throat> when I was about 15 and I started studying this passage, I loved it because I realized there was a secret to success right here in this verse. Be obedient. Be obedient to the word of God. If you want to have success, listen, this world measures success differently than God measures success. Success is not about status. It's not about position. It's not about money. Success in this life is about obedience to God, period. If God tells you to get on a plane and go to a third world country and you win one person to Jesus, then you were successful because you were obedient. It doesn't matter what it looks like to everybody else. Obedience to God is success. Nothing more, nothing less. Amen? Verse 8, it goes on to say this, study the book of instruction continually. Do you know what the book of instruction is? God's word. Two of you knew. That's fantastic. Okay. Verse 8, I'm going to read it again. Study the book of instruction continually. That is study the word of God continually. He says meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. How much was he to obey? Everything. Everything. Everything written in it. Do you want to know why Joshua was a fearless leader? Because he knew the word. Listen to me. We are coming into a day and a time where you better know the word of God. It's going to be real hard to stand on something you don't know. And I know it can be intimidating. I realize that if you've just given your life to Christ, it's a big book. You're like, I don't even know where to start. Go to the book of John, okay? Start in the book of John. Jump on version and download the plan that we read. All of that's fantastic. But listen, guys, this whole, the church only eating on Sundays, maybe grabbing yourself a snack in midweek is not going to be enough in the last days. It will not be. I've told my kids since they were little, every day of their life, I asked them, hey, what have you read today? What are you reading in the word of God today? And I used to have one of them that would say, He'd quote the scripture. Well, I knew it was the verse of the day because I have you version too. It's fantastic. And I'm like, that's great. I love that verse. That's fantastic. But do you only plan on having an appetizer all day today for food? Mom. I'm like, because that's exactly what you're doing. If all you're doing is taking in one verse today, all you're doing is eating an appetizer. Anybody ever fasted before? No? Okay. A handful of us, fantastic. We're going to challenge you next week. I, there is some good. Yeah. <laughs> the fact is, you know that when you fast, your body gets weak, right? When you don't put the word of God in, you spiritually get weak. You can't stand in the face of opposition. Joshua could not have stood in the face of opposition had he not been with God. If he didn't know the word of God, God said, you're going to have to be obedient. You're going to have to meditate on it. What does that mean? Think about it over and over and over and over and over. So when the moment comes and the challenges are, you're facing, you can say to yourself, no, 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 no. I am not going to deviate to the right or to the left. I'm going to stand on your word. I don't care what everybody else is doing. Cannot tell you how many times in my life I told myself in my head, I don't care what everybody else is doing. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, period. I may not have any friends. It doesn't make any difference. We will serve the Lord. And guys, that's what we're going to have to do today. It's time for some believers to step up and live fearlessly. You know, as pastors, we have to continually remind ourselves that there is a really big difference between offering a sermon on Sunday and a message from God. And there's a really big difference. A sermon is a, uh, a compilation of scriptures and stories and uh, illustrations that's put together in a pretty little package so that you can enjoy doing church on Sunday and then going home and going about your week. But as pastors, we carry a very, very heavy weight. And that weight, that burden, 
is to make sure that when we stand in this pulpit, that we deliver to you a message from God, something that you need to hear straight from the heart of the Father, something you need to hear for the days and the times that we're living in so you will be best prepared to live out your faith and to be successful, to be obedient in everything that God has called you to do. We strive to never stand in front of you and bring you a sermon. We want to always bring you a message. And this series has been very heavy on our hearts for months Way before Asbury, way before any of this, God's been stirring our heart for months, really for years. For such a time as this, with what we see God doing right now in these last days. And I, I, I can't tell you how vitally important it is that you push past the sermon and you listen to this message. Don't say that as, as pastors, we never told you what we've been telling you in this series and what we're about to tell you in the closing of today's message. The world that we're living in is immoral, and it is dark, it is evil, and it's corrupt. The nation that we are living in is not the nation that we grew up in. It's not the same country, and it never will be again. I would love to tickle your ears and tell you what you want to hear, but I'm sorry. I'm called to a higher level than that. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And the word of God is so clear in what it's going to look like in these last days as God is shaking the earth with revival and awakening. These are the last days. The bad news may be that America will never be the America that we grew up in. But the good news is Jesus is coming back. And we are his church. And we are still here which means we are still on assignment, which means we still have a job to do. You and I both know so many people that are sleeping in the dark. They're sleeping. They don't know who Jesus is. And you and I have got to get really busy doing the work of ministry and helping people realize in these last days that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the one way to heaven. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. We've got to get the message out. It's never been about Brad and Misty or Mountain Movers Church. It's about Jesus. We have to make Jesus famous. So what am I telling you today? The world is dark now. You think it's dark now. It's going to get darker. Our culture is corrupt. It's going to become more corrupt. And as it does, the enemy is going to continue to leverage fear. You don't believe me. You think just a couple years back, end of 2019, 2020, look at how the enemy began making this transition leveraging his power throughout the world to initiate fear in the hearts of humans. Think about it. He got us to stand six feet apart. He got us to stay at home, cowering in fear that we were going to get sick and die. He had all of us, all of humanity, scattering and scurrying around in fear so that he, through human leaders, could control people. Why does he want to control us? He doesn't want us to obey God. If you think COVID was bad, you wait until church is illegal. It's coming. Persecution is coming. The leveraging of fear is coming like we've never seen it before. Mark my words. And time will tell as these months move forward, as this year continues on, who knows, maybe even into next year. Think about it. It's going to grow darker and darker. The question is, are you going to succumb to that fear or are you going to be fearless? Are you going to be one of those casual Christians that just gets swept away by the storm of fear? Or are you going to be one of those bold believers that God has called for these last days to be obedient, to use the gifts that he's called you to, that he's given you, to activate those gifts and to be bold and to be loud and to be different and make a difference before Jesus comes back. Which Christian are you? That's what I want to know today. Yeah. We're calling you today to be fearless. And so we've given you a, a card today as these were distributed to you as you came through the door. And we'll make this available to those of you that are a part of our online campus. <clears throat> but I want you to look on the back. We really want this message to get ingrained into your heart and into your spirit. So we want you to keep this piece of paper uh, in your Bible uh, or on your fridge or on your uh, dash of your car. Keep it somewhere where you're going to see it regularly. But I want to walk through 
some of the elements that you see in this coat of arms. And uh, I, I want it to get burned deep into your spirit as we uh, talk about this message of being fearless. You see the coat of arms, you know, the coat of arms just represents uh, who we are and what we're all about. It's a reminder of, of, of really why we exist as a, as a church family, any organization really that has a coat of arms. But you know, it should remind us though, that of our undying commitment to engage the kingdom of darkness and to awaken those who are sleeping. The lion, we want to be a reminder that we should be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we should be fearless in the face of persecution. I love Proverbs 28 and 1. It says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Listen, persecution is coming. Make no mistake about it. But Jesus said, blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. Get ready, get ready, get ready. The heart is a reminder that your whole heart belongs to God. God wants your whole heart. He wants all of you. He wants you to return to your first love. He wants you to be madly in love with Jesus. And it was Jesus himself who said the greatest commandment is is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The sword, may it be a reminder that the sword is the word of God. It's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You and I, in these last days of revival and awakening, we are called to be diligent, to present ourselves approved to God, workers who do not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. It has to be about the word of God. You have to know the word of God and be able to stand on the word of God because when the winds of this culture blow, you're going to get swept away if you don't know what the word says. That's why half of the church of today is weak and anemic Because they don't know the truth of what God's word says. And it is half of the church that we believe, according to the parables of Jesus Christ, that they will be left behind and will remain after the rapture. That's another teaching for another day. But my question for you is, which half are you? Are you standing on the word of God? Do you know what it says? Are you ready? Are you fearless? The praying hands, let that be a reminder that we are a praying church and we should be a praying people. It should remind us that God's house must be a house of prayer. We have to be a church that touches heaven, terrorizes hell, grieves and believes together. Prayer is the battle and it's the key ingredient for revival within the church and an awakening throughout the world. The church should be a reminder that we are are a family. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We're fellow soldiers and we draw our strength from one another through community, unity, serving, giving, and sharing. We are the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The flame finally is a reminder that God's presence has got to be our priority. It should remind us that God is our fire by night. He will always guide us He will surely uh, surround us and his power will continually fill us. And as John Wesley said, if you will just get on fire for God, then people will come from miles around to watch us burn. And that should be our prayer as a church, is that we would be a church on fire. I love this church and I'm not talking about the building. You can just take this building away and, and guess what? The church will remain because the church is you and the church is me. I love the local church. We have been called by God to do something something great. We are plan A. There is no plan B. It is the local church that is going to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ so that those who are dead in their sins will come to life in Jesus Christ. It's our job to be the church. We've got to get our hearts on fire for God so that people will come from every direction. We've had a vision for years that, that in our day, we're going to see people come from every direction literally, not, this, not just metaphorically. They're going to come from every direction. I believe people are going to get saved in the parking lot. People are going to be out in the field on their face in the grass, repenting of their sins and calling out to God, calling out to him to just forgive them of their sins. And they're going to come radically running to Jesus. They're going to get saved. People are going to get healed. Jesus is going to be glorified. Do you believe it? 
Isn't it exciting to be a part of the local church in these last days? He calls us to be fearless. 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 Let's pray today. Father, we are so grateful for your word. Grateful, God, that you speak to the hearts of pastors, God, like us and so many other pastors around the world, God, right now who are hearing your voice and they're preaching the word of truth. As we look around the world, God, and we watch Christian news, we are seeing so many people persecuted in various countries for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that there are so many things happening, God, that are just catastrophic, just chaos, wickedness, evil that is being unleashed all over the planet, God, but we're not gonna be afraid. We're not going to give in to the fear that the enemy tries to to put in our hearts, God. We're not going to cower down. We're not going to shy away. We're going to stand up. We're going to be your church. We're going to be bold. We're going to be loud. We're going to be different. We're going to stand on the word of God. We're going to say what needs to be said when it needs to be said. We're going to be who you called us to be and do what you called us to do without apology, without shame. We won't turn away, God. Give us the heart, God, of Joshua in these last days, that after having spent time in your presence and being empowered by your presence, God, that we would be ready to boldly declare the truth of your word with anyone and everyone that we come into contact with. Don't let us be casual Christians, God. Don't let us shy away from the truth in love. God, help us to be obedient servants of Jesus Christ. Set our hearts on fire, God, that many people in our communities, God, would come from miles around to watch us burn. Do it now in our day, in our hearts. Let it start, God, with me. Let it start in the heart of each and every person in this room under the sound of my voice and every person that is joining us online and watching this message today. Father, we love you, and we thank you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you a very important question. We ask this question every service, and the reason we do is because this is the reason why this church exists, to lead people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. So I have to ask you, Have you invited Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life? If you haven't, what are you waiting for? This is the day of salvation. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, it's a matter of asking God to simply forgive you of your sins. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We need a Savior. His name is Jesus. It's about believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and it's only through Him we can be saved. It's about confessing with your mouth Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. So if you're making that decision today, we're going to pray this prayer of repentance as a church together because that's what the church is. is We do life together. But I want to know who's making that decision today. So if you're watching online, would you just simply comment in the comment section below, all in, so we know you're making that decision. If you're in this room, would you just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for today? Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray this prayer together, church. Father, Father, forgive me of my sins. sins. I believe with all my heart. heart. Jesus is the Son of God. God. I confess Jesus Jesus to be Lord of my life life from this moment forward. forward. Help me to be fearless. Help me to to stand strong. strong. Knowing the Word of God. Speaking the word of God, believing the word of God. Help me to be obedient in everything you've called me to do, in everything you've called me to say. I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray.